Hello there. Welcome to another session of Digital Slide Review and Sign Out. I'm Dr. Lewis Hassel coming to you from the campus of the University of Oklahoma Health Sciences Center. And our program is part of the Digital Anatomic Pathology Academy, which is uh, jointly sponsored by Path Presenter and the Digital Pathology Association. Our case today comes from the realm of uh, GI pathology with a little mixture of uh, some other uh, disciplines in pathology as well uh, to make it interesting uh, and enjoyable. Uh, we'll include some cytology and also a little bit of uh, microbiology, I guess. Uh, the patient is a uh, individual who's been incarcerated for a while. Uh, he has uh, had some malaise and been experiencing weight loss and more recently has had uh, some fairly uh, uh, remarkable uh, abdominal pain, some diarrhea, and bloating. Uh, well, that led to uh, GI evaluation and ultimately it was persuaded to undergo endoscopy. Uh, at the time of endoscopy, uh, the uh, images from his uh, upper duodenum were a little bit on the uh, funny looking side. Uh, there was a number of this sort of linearity uh, features to the mucosa, some raised white areas, um, and a little bit of obscuring of the uh, uh, background uh, vasculature, a little erythema and so forth. So these were biopsied um, with a, a question as to uh, whether this was a neoplastic infiltration or some other process of inflammatory uh, nature going on and uh, causing his uh, malabsorptive symptoms. Of note, however, he did clinically have uh, uh, peripheral eosinophilia, uh, which raised concern for possible parasite infection. Of course, that uh, clini clinical piece of information was uh, uh, communicated to us after the fact, uh, as it were. So here are a couple of his biopsies. Uh, we'll uh, zoom in here and take a look at these. You can see uh, fragments of uh, bowel with a little bit of uh, sort of villus uh, blunting, if you will, and architectural loss here. Uh, but even at this magnification, I think you can begin to pick out that there's some extra things in here. Uh, there's a little bit of uh, funniness going on in his <clears throat> crypts. Um, and as we come into higher magnification, we see that uh, this material uh, does not appear to be uh, uh, fecal uh, necessarily. It has a little bit of a uh, structural nature to it. Uh, there's some uh, granular debris uh, associated with it. <clears throat> and it has this uh, sort of peripheral rim of uh, enhancement. Additionally, we've got a bit of uh, histiocytic reaction in the tissue, uh, maybe some eosinophilia, although uh, that's difficult to gauge in the small bowel uh, as well. Uh, so this uh, appearance, as we look a little further, uh, at the other areas uh, is quite suggestive of uh, strongyloides. Uh, here we can see a little fraction, fragment of this uh, uh, worm uh, and more coils of the worm and larvae uh, here in the mucosa. Uh, so this is the appearance of uh, strongyloides stercoralis, uh, which certainly fully accounts for his symptoms uh, that uh, he was experiencing uh, as when this infection becomes established, it can certainly lead to diarrhea and weight loss, uh, malabsorptive uh, symptoms. Uh, Strongyloides is a nematoid. Um, and unlike many uh, parasites, it is actually capable of penetrating the skin and then establishing its own reproductive capability within the small bowel. Uh, it does reproduce uh, sexually, and so it does require uh, some uh, sort of a population, if you will, of uh, larvae to reach that location. Now, typically these uh, organisms remain within the lumen, uh, although getting there, they can transfer uh, through various tissues. We've mentioned the skin, the bloodstream, the lungs, and so forth. And we'll talk about the life cycle a little bit later on. Uh, when they're established in the GI tract, there's usually relatively little attachment to the villi, but they do uh, sort of burrow into the crypts and uh, can cause this eosinophilia and potentially even small granulomata. The concern, of course, is that uh, when uh, any of these patients uh, who have this sort of a challenge, uh, this sort of an infestation going on, um, become suddenly in, immunosuppressed or receive steroid administration, 
they can very quickly evolve into a hyperinfection syn syndrome that can be fatal. Uh, that leads to a sort of a restive appearance on the part of these uh, parasites, which then become more invasive, involve other organs, and can produce uh, very severe symptoms. Fortunately, anti-helminthic drugs are usually quite effective, including ivermectin or albendazole, um, on fairly short courses, uh, which may or may not be repeated to ensure a complete uh, clearance of the uh, uh, parasite. Well, I thought I'd give you some other examples of how this uh, can appear. Uh, so I did a, a sort of a search of a database to see, and here I came up with a, a little bit of a gastric biopsy, uh, which also can be involved, uh, but in this case, there was just this single spot uh, so here's a very subtle uh, finding in a gastric biopsy. And you see the characteristic finding is this sort of clear zone, uh, which is the non-staining chitinous uh, uh, zone of the, the parasite and this, the central uh, organelles of the uh, organism, sort of distending the lumen of this crypt slightly. Now, uh, we also found this very remarkable resection this section uh, which uh, is obviously, again, small bowel. Um, and uh, in this uh, circumstance, you can again see lots of these uh, organisms down in the crypts, uh, all the way down here to the base of these uh, crypts um, with the characteristic size and internal structures of uh, this organism. Um, I don't have the particulars on why this one was resected. Um, and one thing that you can sometimes do in these circumstances is look to see if you can identify eggs uh, in these organisms um, or in the lumen uh, on occasion. Um, and I don't see that in this uh, particular section, uh, but that also could be helpful in identification. Um, Again, you get the sense that the worm sort of coils up a little bit, and curves around within these uh, crypts, um, and obviously infecting more than one uh, crypt uh, very close by one another, um, engaged in uh, whatever reproductive activities they uh, want to carry on in this location. So you can imagine how a fairly significant infestation like this could cause symptoms. Note, however, that the lamina propria, just mildly inflamed, the submucosa is not affected at all. Uh, if we look again around here, uh, well, we see a little bit of uh, eosinophilia, but nothing very striking in terms of uh, response. Now, uh, because of the life cycle of this organism, um, finding it in tissue is certainly not an infrequent way, but you can also detect the, the uh, larvae within stool samples within sputum samples occasionally, um, and uh, in uh, endemic areas uh, within soil samples as well. Uh, the eggs may be seen on occasion in the stool um, if the infestation extends fairly distally um, as well as in tissue. Uh, now, uh, let's just take a look at uh, what it looks like in sputum. Uh, here's a, a sputum sample stained with um, the uh, uh, Gimsa technique, and we'll go right to the uh, uh, organisms here. As you can see, um, the full organism has a pointed tail um, and various internal structures uh, can be identified. And you might also be able to identify other um, forms in here as well. In our next slide, also a sputum, sputum sample. Um, this one stained rather <clears throat> with uh, hematoxylin and eosin um, from sort of a sputum cell block that was concentrated. And I think you can see at low magnification that it's just filled uh, with uh, larval forms here um, in this sample, uh, you know, worm after worm after worm here um, in the uh, structure. Now, I'm not an expert on the internal structures of this uh, uh, nematode, uh, but pointed tail, uh, some internal structure, sexual organs, and uh, size appropriate uh, in the clinical setting uh, is uh, strongyloides, unless uh, shown to be otherwise. 
Um, and then one last sample also from a sputum, um, this one stained with um, the acid fast stain, I believe. And as we come into magnification here, again, you can see uh, lots of the organisms uh, within here. And so you get a, a little different view of the internal structures. So what is the life cycle and how do, is it that we happen to find it in the, both the stool and in the uh, respiratory uh, samples? Well, if we begin with the larvae in the soil, uh, those can become sexual and uh, produce eggs within the soil that then uh, produce additional larvae, or they can directly mature uh, into infective filiform larvae that are then able to penetrate the skin. These rhabditiform larvae usually are not able to penetrate the skin, but once they become filariform, uh, they can. Uh, once in the body, and both dogs and humans can be definitive hosts, uh, the uh, wort larvae migrate uh, through various pathways, which can include uh, bloodstream to lungs, to airways, then to the GI tract and various locations in the GI tract. Once established in that uh, small bowel GI tract uh, region, uh, they then uh, differentiate into sexual larvae, uh, produce uh, offspring. And then there's this potential for this auto-infective uh, cycle to uh, perpetuate itself, which can lead to a really uh, full-blown uh, infestation, such as affected the, uh, our incident patient in this case. Uh, so that's how we get this sort of hyperinfection. It's not that we just get tons of larvae that uh, cross the skin and all happen to congregate. Uh, it's because we have this uh, auto-infectious uh, cycle that occurs uh, leading to uh, uh, high uh, parasite loads. So uh, in summary, our sign out diagnosis is strongyloides infestation. Um, and there are certain endemic areas where this is more commonly encountered. Uh, south, southeastern U.S. and subtropical regions where the soil temperatures are warm, but it's also been detected in various institutionalized uh, patients, and it's not completely clear uh, how the manner of trans, uh, transmission is there, whether there's a patient-to-patient -patient transfer or not. So thanks so much for joining me, and if uh, you have uh, questions, please don't hesitate to uh, share those in, your, in the comments. Or if you uh, like this and uh, find found it useful, please hit that like button and uh, subscribe. You know the drill. Well, thanks so much for being with me, and uh, I hope that uh, until next time that you this will uh, uh, enrich your education and perspective on some of the GI diseases that uh, can be encountered. Uh, we always uh, look forward to your comments and suggestions for additional videos that we ought to produce, and so we welcome those. So until next time, thanks for joining us.